Very good. So let's get started. It's a pleasure to have you, Zul. Tell us about uh, higher dimensional gravity. Thank you. Um, I'm very glad I have this opportunity to talk a bit about uh, our recent work. It's a work with uh, Simone Kuhner and Davey, and uh, based on these two papers. So let me just start by um, the motivation. So we all know Einstein's general relativity are very successful to describe gravity theory and no energy near method. So uh, it's it's actually natural to ask. So it's a uh, no energy limit of a uh, possible quantum gravity. So it's natural to ask this question. So if we assume if we assume the the, the graviton the gravity theory obeys causality. At all energies, can we actually put some constraints to the modification or corrections to Einstein gravity? In the in the no energy limit. So this is uh, what we want to answer in these two papers. And uh, uh, the model we consider is uh, basically just the no energy limit of the, uh, sorry, uh, the no energy effective field theory of gravity. And uh, I, I just write down the Lagrangian, the effective action. This is a general, this is the action in general dimensions. But there will be some subtlety in no dimensions, like for example in four dimensions. So, and uh, I, I, I don't just go into much details about that. And a bunch of uh, higher derivative terms. So, this one is the, the usual uh, Einstein Herbert action, and the C is actually just the wild invariant, uh, sorry, the, the wild tensor. So we have the higher derivative terms and higher and higher to, to um, describe some effects from UV. And uh, what we assume at this energy limit is uh, we study the weakly coupled theory, which means we consider a limit that if we have a, uh, we assume we have a, we, we have a um, heavy, heavy mass M, we are from uh, starting with this M, the heavy scale, there will be some unknown uh, new physics or UV effects. Um, and we assume this, this mass gap over the plant mass is much, much smaller than one, so, so that uh, we are in the weakly coupled limit. And uh, let me just be more precise about our convention. It's, the Newton constant here is basically just like uh, the plant mass to yeah. it's like this. So, sorry, when you say much smaller, how small? Can you put the actual number on this, or is it? Sorry. So, how small is this? How is uh, How small is, uh, yeah. is is this? Yes. Oh, um, so we do have a. Uh, the precise number of this, we just assume this is uh, small enough to ignore any loop effects but and, and no energy. But your bounds will depend on this limit, right? Um, our bounds will depend on, will depend on, so, yeah, our bounds will depend on this limit. Okay. Uh, basically, just ignore all the contributions uh, from higher orders in, in, in this thing. Uh, okay. So, um, so the idea is to, so if we assume the weakly coupled theory, the idea is to use uh, some notion of the causality, um, unitarity to give bounds on this recent coefficients in terms of, uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, Einstein constant, uh, sorry, <laughs> Newton constant. Um, so there's a previous work, for example, by 
sorry, let, let, me, let me be more precise about this limit. Just try to make sure. So we can draw, we can draw actually a diagram. Uh, this is the energy scale, and uh, energy scale goes up here. And there is a, the mass gap here, and uh, this is the, the region of our EFT theory, uh, of our EFT. And we're, uh, so this is a low energy, and there is possible some uh, light, some light take, uh, some light matter, rotating modes. And above this M, it would be some uh, on low end UV, but we assume it obeys causality in unitarity, and there would be a Planck mass. So we assume mm -hmm. this gap is very large, and like goes to infinity, so then we can draw all loop effects. So there's some a previous work by, uh, we, we call it CMZ bound. So they, they use causality analysis, they, um, uh, they constraints, how, how this, like, how this recent coefficient should be. And what they found is that, like, for example, this alpha 2, it goes like uh, 1 over m squared, and f of 4 should be smaller than uh, 1 over m to the 4th with some unknown, some undetermined number. So we actually want to uh, make this bound sharp. So that means we want to put explicit number here. Um, so this is basically our setup. But uh, there's actually a subtlety of this, uh, of this uh, effective action and no energy. Um, is that this effective action is actually ambiguous. Here. Are you assuming those numbers are order one? Sorry? Are you assuming those numbers are order uh, one? This alpha two? No, no, this? where you wrote uh, Q2 is less than yeah. Yeah, they, um, in their paper, they assume this number should be some order one. And you're also this, assuming this or not? We don't assume it, we just, uh, we, we just, uh, I should say we basically prove this, because we get an uh, order one number. If you don't assume it's order one, how do you know you can ignore the effects? Mm -hmm. um, so, so there will be... What's the question? Can you repeat the question? If you don't assume that the coefficient what he wrote order one and, and the one over m squared. If you don't assume that's order one, how do you know you can ignore the effects in the low energy theory? Well, you said you weren't assuming you can ignore the right? Does, and and this just m is much more than one blank. I mean, if you take m low enough, you can definitely ignore loop effects. And then. No, if you take, if that order one number one. is very large, then don't no, have to include start, the effects. Start, the, start the argument with m is small. Yeah. Well, we can definitely ignore loop effects. Why can I ignore loop effects if I don't know anything about the coefficients? Well, it, well, if, if the loop effects are, are important at some scale, yes. just lower the scale. They have to be smaller. <coughs> so we, we, we no, so sorry. The my assumption, you're... assumption we're making is that yes. there exists some m that's yes. small enough for loop effects to be neglected. Sorry, m is small enough. Sorry, no, but if m is too small, then You'll have a higher. You'll have irrelevant interactions that are suppressed by powers of. Well, the idea is they'd be suppressed by powers of m, but you're not assuming that. So now you could have. You're working at some energy scale. You'll have powers of that energy scale in the numerator, which is more than. I'll just say what we prove. We move on. We prove that if you assume that these coefficients are not parametrically large, we prove that they're bounded by order one constants. Okay. I'll use that argument. I think you can use the argument to show that they are bounded periodically without making an assumption, but that's an exercise. What we prove is that assuming they're not parametrically large, they're bounded. But isn't that the same thing as assuming that those are order one numbers? No. Because if those numbers are very large, sorry, you're assuming that they're not parametrically large, but isn't that, it sounds no, like it's the same as assuming they're order one divided by n squared. Parametrically no, no, large, no, then evaluate the scale of energies that you're interested in. It's about the dependence on that. Is it about? There always has to exist some m low enough that you can ignore that these things are parametrically small. 
sorry, M right now is the regime of the effective theory. So I can use, I can evaluate in any energies all the way up to M. So in parts of the theory is added up to m of 10 to 15 GV, plus some added up to 10 to 10 GV. And then the, the lower you make the Sorry, if, if, I, yeah, if I make m very small, so yeah. let's say it's 1 GV, yeah. let's say I have an irrelevant interaction where the, where the coefficient downstairs is 10 to the minus 10 EV, yeah. that's going to be a very large no, interaction which I can't ignore. No, if you put yourself in this scenario, you have to, put, you have to start with a cutoff that's less than 10 to the minus 10 EV. But then, sorry, isn't that circular? Mm. Oh. They're now but assuming... But would probe with that there are some new physics. So I thought your point was you're not assuming anything about the size of these coefficients. Yeah. If I'm just saying that, but, but I'm saying that those coefficients, if are an order of a number divided by 10 to the minus 10 EB, then you can't probe that there's a particle. Or particle or maybe we should move on, but I think yeah. this question is something about the spectrum. Argument would probe the existence of new particle without 10 to the minus 10 Yeah, so, so, uh, uh, should I move on? <laughs> so this actually is some uh, um, ambiguity in the effective action is that so we can use the theory definition and the equation of motion to, to, to basically change the profile of the effective action. For example, this is a very simple example is that in D equals 4, we can actually just kill C squared. That is uh, basically Riemann squared in four dimensions. So in, in this way, we basically choose to study the two to two graviton amplitude, and uh, because the amplitude would be only ambiguous, uh, no matter how you do the field definitions. And uh, we assume the we, we we assume this weekly Hubble region so that we can write down the energy amplitude um, all just by tree level amplitude. And uh, so in general, this graviton amplitude can be written as some uh, polynomials in terms of uh, momentum and uh, polarizations times some pure function which is only a function of the uh, minus and variables. Yeah. So this is uh, our setup. So why we're interested in this is that, uh, uh, yeah. So we have two words. Uh, one is just focusing on four dimensions and another is higher dimensions. So in four dimensions, we are interested in four dimensions because it's more relevant to a real world. And uh, if, if, if we are um, focusing on a scale that we can equal the, the effects with the Hubble radius. And uh, so um, focusing on 4D and we get some bounds using the notion of causality and so on. And that would probably provide a way um, for experimental tests for like notion of causality if we understand causality in a correct way. But there's a problem in 4D, well, I, I'm not sure if it's a problem, but uh, uh, in 4D, our bounds are actually having um, IR divergence like uh, uh, the, we have to for example if we have an upper bound we have to we have to introduce a sort of the IR cutoff so this is the um, the property of 4D but but this IR um, divergence is probably fine because for example, if we if we are interested in ADS, this arrow cutoff could be just uh, um, ADS radius, and uh, if we are in a real world something, uh, I I mean we can probably just replace this IR divergent by some sort of the Hubble radius. Sorry. Sorry. What experiment do you have in mind that you might compare this with? 
because I thought that the effects of this correction to experimental uh, observations are ridiculously tiny that you yeah. have no hope of testing anything. Um, experiments, I don't have the experiments in mind. <laughs> but uh, um, the, it's, it's possible that, so, so we have a bound for, for these recent coefficients. And these recent coefficients can measure the deviation from Einstein gravity from like uh, observations in, in cosmology and so on um, at, at large scales. So probably that could be measured. I'm not sure. Before, obviously, and there are arguments that the corrections are just too small. Yeah. Too far away from any experimental uh, test. Um, maybe that's wrong. I don't know. That's what I. Yeah, so the experiments are too small. Yeah, sure. Uh, but yeah, in the future, probably. Things will happen in the future. But I think we're talking about you know seven orders of magnitude below what you would expect to see. Those are the orders. Sorry. Uh, the, the corrections you would see to experimental signatures from this effect that you're discussing are about 70 orders of magnitude mm -hmm. below what you can see. So you have to assume that humanity will go on for a long time. Well, let me put it differently. Uh, but you agree with this, right? Well, it depends, depends what, your, what your bias for M is. So, so I agree that you know, if you see something in an astrophysics setup, just because of the size of the objects you're seeing, you have some, it must be seen that the scale of M is like 10 to the scale of M. So M is non-gravitational, right? So wouldn't you see stuff about M in a technical theory without gravity before you see it in gravity? Well, the question we're trying to answer, and we we'll decide to what extent progress to other questions, suppose an experiment about gravity measure a derivative of correction and see it with 10 to minus 10 meters. You can ask, does that contradict not seeing the exact particle at the HC or things like this? That's what we're trying to Should answer. Be. The consistency between gravity and either. Oh. Do you think maybe the people are told to test the gravity, they should or think more about fires? Uh, this thing we have to not couple to the sun. No, say it's only couple gravitation, and then I understand what this is the assumption. Yeah. So yeah. That matters. Okay. Um, and this uh, four dimensions, and in four higher dimensions. There will be no log divergence, so it's good. There's no IO divergence. We can get a we can get a bound with the pure number. And uh, why we're interested in higher dimensions, as uh, uh, explained actually by David for his lecture, uh, it, it it joins the applications to NSFT. Um, based on the work by Simone. And David. So, um, it, it actually has the application state as FT in the sense that if we obtain the bounding in flat space, we can actually lift it to a bounding in ADSFT. For example, this also from the CMZ paper is that uh, the, the correction, uh, sorry, the, the bound on alpha 2 can be translated to a bound on central charges in a way that uh, uh, proof it, uh, it, it must be suppressed by some uh, dimension gap in CFT. Sorry, it should be screwed. So, so we, we study both 4D and higher D and uh, obtain some uh, rib response.
And our, our, our trick is that, so we use unitarity plus causality, where the unitarity means that, uh, of course, the S matrix, the square of S matrix is 1, is a unit, and, it, and uh, the causality, this is unitarity, and we understand the causality as a um, an elasticity of this matrix with the with the quasi symmetry. So this is our tool to to trying to get about. And also, we actually we don't directly study the amplitude. We define a smeared amplitude. Uh, so that the amplitude is smeared by some uh, wood function. This is defined by the Euler amplitude, where t is equal to minus p squared um, times smeared by some weak function, some some some, some weak function um, of p. Can you comment on, on what, uh, what, what is proven about this analyticity? What, what what are you assuming, and what is exactly? Sorry? Can you can you comment on on if you are assuming this uh, property about causality yeah. being related to about analyticity? Is, is it assumption, right? Yeah, it's assumption. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's assumption. But uh, there's a simple model from from a paper yeah. by CMZ. Okay. The sigma model shows this is okay. true. Yeah, but it's a simple model, so we assume it should be in general for even okay. asymmetric models. So. And and we uh, we basically just uh, smeared the amplitude by a uh, wave function, and this wave function we should we should find a wave function, um, which is fastly decay at large b uh, at the impact parameter. B, where it means. It means that we can do a Fourier transform for this for this wave function. Let's call it uh, Poisson theta, which is a Fourier transform with respect to the momentum transform. And this function should should be decaying fast enough um, in the impact parameter space. <coughs> so if we assume so, actually, what we um, we have a rough argument is that we can show this mirror amplitude and very high energy is actually bounded by, let's say, by a constant, by all the one constant times the energy. And, and this is actually recently, I think, it's basically proved by a paper by Kenyemi and Sasha for, uh, but they only consider that the external particles <coughs> are stainers. So th this is basically our assumption, and we just play with this assumption you know, to get a bound for, for, for um, recent coefficients. And the idea is that, um, So if we have these assumptions, we can do we can construct a dispersive sum rule. That is, we start with the um, the ace plan, the complex ace plan, and uh, uh, we have a very very we have an infinite arc. So based on our assumption, we would have a cut, some branch cut starting with the, the scale m squared. And of course it's a it's shadow under Poisson symmetry. So from here it's a, it's a UV region that we know few about. We only have a 
ultra wave expansion and the unitarity to use. And uh, this is an infinity arc that s goes to infinity. We're based on our assumption here. Um, we can drop the infinity arc if we consider. Oh, sorry. If we consider this subtraction. And uh, so, so we start with the infinity arc, which can be dropped, and we can deform the uh, integral contour so that it basically goes like this. <clears throat> but there will be some uh, low energy poles that we should pick up when we, when we deform to, 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 uh, to the small arc. And also, there will be contributions along the branch cuts that we have to do with. So for this region, we know it's a no region in the, at, the, at the EFT region. So we have an EFT expansion for our amplitude. Well, along the cuts, we don't know. But we know one thing is that uh, along the cuts, the amplitude must, must be having some partial wave expansion. With the unknown but positive spectral densities. I'll show this in more details later. Um, but uh, sorry, so this, the sorry. statement is that the integral of this smeared amplitude over s squared on the small arc is equal to the one on the on the branch cuts. That's what you're. Yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah. So yeah, we we will analyze the IR and UV respectively. So basically, we have a we have a two things to do with. First, we have to do with the lone parts. Uh, that uh, the IR parts, we should uh, write down the the general known energy effective uh, amplitude for known energy effective field theory. And for the UV part, we should uh, construct the partial waves and uh, expand the amplitude in terms of the partial waves with, with the with the positive spectral, uh, positive spectral density uh, along the cuts. So um, let's start with the uh, IR. Sorry. Let's start with the IR. So in the IR, the idea is that uh, the IR is basically in the region of this small arc, and uh, and the limit that we can ignore the any loop effects. There will be no cuts between zero and n squared. There's there are just simple poles. Then we can um, pick up the residues. And, uh, but uh, in this sense, we have to be actually a bit more careful about the IR because for, for the spinning amplitude, because uh, as I said, let me just review. The amplitude can be written as the polynomials of a momenta and polarization times a pure function of madness and variables. So that means we have to carefully choose the, the, this basis, this polynomial basis, so that um, what we want to construct the, um, the, the dispersive sum rule for this pure function wouldn't have any spurious poles. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense to, to, to talk about the poles and, uh, and, and uh, no energy limits. Uh, fortunately, this good basis is actually worked out by by this paper by Child Hurry Endo, etc. 
So the idea is that we actually have some building blocks. I just give some simple examples. Uh, we have some building blocks. For example, we can construct a building block called the H12, which basically just F1, mu nu, F2, mu nu. Where F is some uh, tensor constructed by the momentum and correlations. Something like that. Um, so, and of course, some other building blocks, it's, it's too much to write down. Um, and so, but the idea is that they, they find this good basis, and so we can expand the, the spinning amplitude in terms of this. Sorry. Yeah, just, uh, just to get an idea. So, for example, how many such tensor structures or how many such amplitudes did you have? So, I guess you. Yeah, I, I, for I, example, in five, I, just to get an idea. I, I'll go to there yeah. uh, soon. So, um, so we have this building blocks, this generators, and uh, so that we can expand the spinning amplitude in terms of the spaces. Uh, one simple example is that uh, for full photon scattering, it can be expanded by by the spaces. permutations where this uh, X and S is just uh, uh, some other building blocks similar to H12 constructed by the momentum and correlations and um, so I, I, based, I just skip the definition because it's a little bit uh, I mean waste of time and but this is the basic idea so this one this one and this one is just the uh, the building blocks we call they call the generators, and uh, this m1, m2, m3 are the pure functions that we should construct some rules for them. And I, I just go to the part that the, you, you asked the question, just to give an idea. Like if we consider graviton, that is uh, what we are considering. Consider graviton for. Um, dimension larger or equal to h, we basically have the twenty line generators. That means we have a, a twenty line basis of something like uh, h one for h two three for graviton, and uh, for d is smaller than h and larger than five, we have to analyze case by case because. There will be some like uh, some more subtleties, like we have a parity art structures, and some new identities to identify some uh, generators. And in D equals four, we it, D equals four would be a case that we um, we can check why this basis is good. And the interesting is that uh, in D equals four, the the basis. The basis they construct basically just uh, uh, boils down to the helicity basis. For example, like uh, like this structure. In D equals four. So, but so in D equals four, we can use the helicity, but in higher dimensions, uh, well, I don't know, probably someone. Constructed the helicity concept in higher dimensions also, but in higher dimensions we uh, just use this uh, this generators with the so that uh, the pure function uh, that we will construct the sum rules will not have the spurious poles. Yeah. What's the what's the counting in forty? Sorry. What's the counting? Yeah, so I can I can list all the possible. Yeah, let me just write down all possible structures.
Yeah, I think this is all possible structures. So one example, I just give some examples of how it works. So, so the, gra the, the two to two amplitude of graviton scattering can be decomposed into this, like for example, in, in higher dimensions, into these 20 knot generators. And one simple example, it's it looks like this. Say so to some basis into one one generator. I didn't write many others because they're too much. So in this simple example, it uh, can be written down with this. So alpha two squared, which is a recent coefficient for c uh, squared c quadratic gravity is the alpha, alpha four for cubic gravity. <coughs> so this is a simple example just to give you some ideas how it works. So this is IR. So IR using this basis, we can we can write down all attitudes, of course with some uh, Einstein Herbert part and uh, and the cubic and quadratic part, cubic part, and uh, more and more higher derivatives ones. Are they are they in question so far? So this is a low energy part, and let's move to the high energy part. How many times do I have? Twenty-five minutes. Okay. No more, more, a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> Thirty minutes. So we move to high energy part. We call I just call it the heavy part. So um, along the cuts, we know few, but we know it can have some partial wave expansion. And the question is that how to construct all possible partial waves for, for 2 to 2 graviton scattering. And the idea is that uh, we can actually write down um, three point vertices to construct the partial waves. Where the three point vertices is a two graviton to get, uh, with uh, one massive gun. This graviton, graviton, this is a massive, massive particle. So we can write down um, three-point vertices, all possible three-point vertices, and glue, glue them together um, to, to, to construct the partial wave. And of course, there will be uh, different representations for these internal guys. So that means we should be careful about, uh, about the construction. We have uh, different irreducible representations. Which should give us different parts of uh, partial waves. And uh, systematically, the amplitude then should be written as something like this for partial wave expansion. This is just a normalization. And, uh, And this pi rho ij is the partial wave which can be obtained by glue two three point vertices. And this rho denotes different representations, and this would be the coefficient that we impose unitarity. Um, that means we have a major part of it, it should be a positive matrix. So this row, let me write here, is uh, the reducible representations of SIOD. Yeah. Um, 
So we write down the vertices according to different representations, and then we glue two vertices together to construct the partial wave. This is the basic idea. Um, so let me. Are there any questions for this part? Yeah. So, so in this, uh, yes, in the, the low energy part, so your assumptions of weak coupling come into the fact that you don't have logs in this low yes, energy. Yes, yeah, exactly. And in loopy factor as well. But, but if, I, if I measure the S matrix at low energy, how can you distinguish these coefficients from the logs? You cannot, right? Um, how can I distinguish the yeah. coefficients? Oh, you're saying uh, the, the, the log effects can be can be absorbed into the coefficients. Are you so, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Is it, does it really make sense to bound this alpha 2, like just from this three level like coefficient? Because because the logs go in, I mean, they go inside, right? Yeah, but uh, we assume the limit that we can ignore the logs. So, so it's basically just, if you think of alpha 2 like some bare, but, but, can, some logs. but can you put an error on this? So let's say. I take this big M to be like 10 to the minus 20 mass Planck. So can you, can, we, can you quantify how much this will change the bound? No, we don't, if we have a loop. So what, why should I care then about? I mean, it's M square and Planck square. Yeah. That's a parameter. I mean, I kind of tell you there were one number in front of M square and Planck square. If you tell me it's 10 to the minus 40, then I'm not really sure. But, but you cannot tell me, if I, if I say it's 10 to the minus 40, you cannot tell me how much it will change, right? Like oh. one sort of time order one coefficient. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so if we write, so if we have loop effects, as you said, this is some uh, alpha two should be what we aim to bound plus some higher order into Newton, or I should say some plan squared, something even higher. And this are um, ignored by our assumptions. Okay. So, but these are loop effects of uh, the gravity. Yeah, of, of the gravity. Yeah. It's, it's a pure gravity theory. We yeah, are but, but you said you have this cutoff M. So, what if there is some particle just above M and you have some loops of this kind? Uh, sorry, what? <laughs> I mean, you, you, there, the low energy effective theory, yeah. you have the cutoff which is not a plant, but it's some other end. Yes, yeah. So what if you have some loops of some other guy just above Yeah, that, that provides, that contributes to cut starting and end. And in that part, we use the partial wave expansion rather than the energy no, but don't, don't expansion. But they give you loops, which are suppressed by 1 over m squared, with loops. Sorry? Uh, oh, you mean this? Yes, yeah. don't you also have loops with 1 over m squared instead of m plant? Uh, one over m squared. Yeah, we. So, uh, I see what you mean. So we we have loops. Uh, so for example, if we have loops suppressed by one over m squared, this this part must have cuts starting at n. So if you think of the. So let, let me put it in this. Way. So if we, if we look at the, um, the complex S plan, any graviton loops will contribute to cuts starting at here. And any, any matter, matter loops, like you said, will starting at uh, M squared that we, we think of it as a UV part that we don't know, but we can do partial wave expansion. But so far, this M is not connected to the scale of the heavy particles. Sorry? So far, this M is not connected to the scale of the heavy yeah, particles. Yeah, so far it doesn't. Yeah. So it's really just, yeah. So we just, the next step is to construct the partial waves, because we have to use it. Um, so for different representations, we can we can draw some uh, young tableau, for example, something like this. I do, I just take one simple example. 
And uh, the trick is to give different vector of scenery polarization vector for, for different lines. For example, for the first line, we give, uh, we give W1 for the second line, W2, the third line, W3, and so on and so on. And this is a representation. Uh, systematically, we can write it as uh, M1, M2, Mm, where Mi is the number of boxes in the in the i i uh, i line. So th this this uh, auxiliary polarizations plays a role like uh, uh, polarizations of graviton, but it's in it's a it's a polarization for general uh, spinning representations, and it satisfies some constraints. So I just give some example how it works. For example, the, the, the simplest example is just the symmetric tensors. <coughs> we can then insert uh, the vector n, where the n is a p1 mu minus p2 mu over p1 minus p2. We can just insert n to fold the boxes, and this will give us uh, And about W1 to some power. And uh, of course, this, and this is just uh, uh, for the case that the external particles are scanners. And we can, of course, have a simple one if we have a correlations like this. And, and uh, maybe a more non trivial example is uh, that we have an a anti symmetric part, for example, like this. We can just insert, uh, for, for photon, we can insert E1, E2 to either the first line, second line, and, and to fill the rest by N. And this will give us uh, three point vertices by like this. It's just uh, examples. Yeah. And uh, so, use this trick, we can, we can write on all possible. Uh, three point vertices for, for different representations and uh, just give some idea like for D marginally equal to 8 we have a 20 uh, graviton, graviton massive couplings a uh, three point vertices and for, for D less than 8 again there would be some subtleties for like parity art and so on um, I don't bother to write it down here and the idea to use this vertice to construct the partial wave is that we can construct a, a sort of a wish shifting operator. Let's call it H mu M1. The rough idea is that uh, this wish this weak shifting operator, when it acting on this representation, it basically just reduces. Reduce one box at the la at the at the um, last line, and we can just do it again and again, and we can uh, at the end we can we can write it we, we can uh, write any partial waves like a bunch of the bunch of different operators acting on symmetric wall uh, rule of symmetric walls, which is uh, just a kick and ball from the waves. So using this trick, we can construct all partial waves um, at UV. And uh, yeah, that's, I think it, yeah. So actually, at the at, at the very beginning, I I didn't use this trick to 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 calculate the the partial waves. There's a paper uh, in in conformal bootstrap, I think. write down, they can construct uh, control blocks for different representations and using that we can actually also 
use that control blocks to construct the partial waves. This is uh, how I first worked, but yeah. So, um, so now we have a no energy and yeah, I keep the no energy here. Now we have a no energy and the high energy. The no energy is uh, usually the empty amplitude at three level. The high energy we can construct the partial waves. So we can finally move to. I think I have uh, ten minutes. A bit more. Yeah. Okay, ten minutes is good. <laughs> so we can finally uh, move to construct the partial waves. Oh, sorry, the, the sum rules. Um, so it's. Let me just draw this picture again. This is important. So because we can, uh, if we consider the smeared aperture, we can grow the infinity arc. So in this way, we can construct this. It's just one example, this uh, sum rule. Infinity. Assumption this this sum rule is an advantage when we really smeared smeared this sum rule like uh, when we so it, it's valid in the sense that we do we do this so uh, this is one example of sum rule and uh, the idea for so an example. Is that uh, if we focus just on one specific sum rules, which is simple, we can write down that when we this is an infinity arc, and we can deform it to pick up residues and energy and uh, to do partial wave expansions and uh, along the cuts, and and energy we will get for this simple example we will get this. So this is the no energy contributions, and this no energy contributions equals to some integral along the cuts. So we uh, they will so we de uh, it develops the imaginary part for the uh, for the aperture along the cuts, and this guy we can do the partial wave expansion, uh, and this is basically what we um, what we play with. But of course, as I said, we have uh, so many different partial waves, and we have uh, so many different generators. So we actually have a uh, Lots of sum rules like this, and we uh, we use all of them to to um, to give some bounds, and to just give some idea how to give bounds. Uh, I finish soon. Uh, I want to just compare the algorithm to bounce the Wilson coefficient with the algorithm that uh, uh, people use to bounce the uh, OPE coefficient. Just to give some idea. Oh. <laughs> Here is the formal bootstrap. Here is uh, EFT bootstrap story. And uh, in component bootstrap, we have an equation like let's say um, lambda phi phi o zero squared. Which equals to a sum of the other operators.
And here we have a we have a equation like this. In general, maybe I, I just write it in a, it can be write as it can be written as a, this g is a g Newton, Newton constant. This this small g is some uh, coupling that we may want to bound, which can be written as a partial wave expansion. Of course, this is the coefficient of partial wave expansion in with the sum function, because we, we like we have this uh, subtractions and so on. So it's not just a pure uh, partial waves. It's a, a lot of, it's a function that which is the partial wave uh, together with some other factors. Now I, I just call it G. So this is the equation, and uh, still we would have to find some functionals. In this way, uh, at this side, let's say the function is some derivatives evaluated at the symmetric point. And this side, we also have some function, let's just call it the functional, call it the function of EFT which is some polynomials in P, in P and of course we have to smear because let's say we have to smear this thing because this is our assumption and the condition here is that the, the standard one is that the functional acting in this function we want to fun find a functional so that it, when it acts on the, this, fun this function f, it's positive definite. And this side is the same. We want to find a function, functional, so that when it acts on the, this function g, it's positive definite. And what we can get is that, uh, so this way we can get, we can bound. The OP coefficient, where this this guy we use, it's an input we determine by more, and this guy is what we want to um, obtain the values. It's an OBJ, and this one, if we um, find such a functional, then what we will get is also some number times times g. So just take this as a simple example: some number times g plus some number times alpha 2 squared minus 2 alpha 4, which is then positive definite. And this one is the number we want to find, it's LBJ. And this one is what we want to fix by norm, like the line, it could be 1 or, or minus 1, uh, depending on its upper bound or lower bound you want to, you want to obtain. So this is the basic, some, uh, sorry, this, this, this is the basic comparison. Hopefully it would make the uh, the algorithm we're using a more clear. Have a question? Yeah. Is there any argument that you can swap the action of functional and the sum on the EFT side? Uh, you mean sorry? You mean this sum? So you have a functional on a sum over spin. Oh yeah. So yeah. Sorry. I should be more precise. So this this is because this is positive. So what we really want to impose is that uh, this functional acting on this G. Uh, which, uh, which is actually also sorry, which is actually actually also depend on uh, the, the spin and the s, which is to be integrated. We have to impose that the functional acting on this function is positive for all spin and all s uh, uh, larger than m squared. I guess I want to ask like uh, first you act your functional on the f, which is the infinite sum of spin. Yeah. And then in the end, you want to act your functional term by term in your g of j, right? But yeah. This requires some permutation of your functional action yeah. and the infinite sum of the spin. Like in yeah. the performed bootstrap side, we have some arguments or papers, results on uh, how we can swap it. Yeah, I see. You're saying the functional acting on the whole thing, can it uh, move? Can you move your functional inside your infinite sum? Um, Is there any check or argument? or? Yeah, yeah you can. 
we can in for the scalar case we did it with such that in, in the scalar case in, with spinning I, I guess it's the same but for the scalar it works yeah. Can I don't know I just take it for granted. <laughs> Thank you for pointing this out. <laughs> <laughs> No, we check actually. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let, can I show the slides? Null constraints at all, so I, I, I didn't mention. But you did uh, so. use them. Uh, yeah, we, we used that. And uh, did, did you? I mean, uh, so usually you at least the way that uh, I seen it being used is by considering expansion around t equals zero, and then you consider like terms that uh, different uh, orders in t, and then you try to match the coefficients. Yeah. Is that how you use the null constraints, or do you have some? Oh um, no, uh, it's not how we use the null constraints. So, so what we use the null constraint is that so uh, th this is just a very simple sum rule, mm -hmm. and in general, the sum rule on the left hand side, you will have an infinite number of Wilson coefficients. Mm -hmm. So that is that we can actually construct some rule so that uh, the sum rule uh, with derivatives um, so that the left hand side uh, there will be just final number of Wilson coefficients. And the reason why we can do that is because we are, in, we are implicitly using the long constraint to cancel some Wilson yeah, coefficients. Yeah, so, so these derivatives you take them at t equals zero, is that... Uh, so, uh, no, we... we yeah. So what but you mean? said something. Uh, you said you take some derivatives to define the. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So but these the derivatives are at t equals uh, zero. Like yeah. That. So yeah, that's what. So that. Uh, so back to Miguel's question. So assume now that you have some very small non-analyticity. So from so ten to the minus twenty or whatever times. Usually you have terms like t squared log minus t or something like that. Now suppose you take a few derivatives, then. Uh, even though the coefficient is very small, this log, if you take a few derivatives, it's blowing up here, right? So, how do you yeah. know this is still if, under control? I mean, how do you, is there some check that, you know, there is this, this would still be under control, even? So, if there is loop, if there is loop, in fact, um, the, the long constraint would probably be modified, but... Uh, yeah, but, I mean, even if it's small, do you know that even the modification would still be small because now it's something small yeah. times something Yeah, yeah, exactly. Up, right? yeah, yeah. I see what you mean, yeah. So, um, the derivative of t equals zero. So I think if you don't use, like, uh, if the derivative, the order of derivative is not too, yeah, too high, yeah. it would be fine. But if you use a very high order of derivatives, it, it would be probably some, uh, causing some problem. But uh, we are, in, in this work, we are bounding, uh, and so in higher dimension work, we are bounding alpha 2 and alpha 4, which is uh, basically not, uh, I, I, I think it avoids this kind of problem. Okay, and just to get an idea, like how many null constraints do you usually impose to get, I don't know, your best bounds? Well, infinite number of non constraints. Ah, you mean you extrapolate in Because we have to cancel a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, Wilson coefficients. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky because there's infinitely many number of null constraints about making this in the code that you explain to remove coefficients. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe a question you would like me to want to know is like how many parameters, how many free parameters we have in our function? Yeah. And that's between two hundred and four hundred. Okay. That's the side of our answers. Oh, okay. So it's a. Uh, let's show the dimensional four dimensional. Yeah, yeah. So this is a four dimensional bound. A uh, one example four dimensional bound. Well, this G three is actually just a Wilson coefficient of uh, cubic gravity, and G four is uh, is uh, Riemann to the fourth. Uh, it's a it's a different convention from what I or uh, what I uh, write down for 
wrote down for um, d dimensions, uh, but uh, this g3 is basically just r2. And uh, yeah, so you can see there will be some log divergence that we can we can um, we can remove. Can I? Yeah. Oh. So this one is the higher dimensional dots, where this alpha two, alpha three is just what I showed before. The 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 Wilson coefficient of quadratic gravity and the Wilson coefficient of cubic gravity, and uh, I, yeah, it's a it's a diff, uh, we we make plot for d equals five, d equals seven, and d equals ten. So it's nicely bounded. Yes, uh, just a question. Is there a limit to what you expect in the limit of uh, infinite? D? Infinite dimensions? Yeah. Well, I don't know, but it seems like this shrinks. I hope it will shrink to zero, but, <laughs> but we don't see. It, it, it's my hope, it, but I don't Excuse know. Excuse me. Or, uh, do the more dimensions give increase the runtime of the, the, of the computations? Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I, I think. No, I, I think it's just, even in five dimensions, the, com the computation is a bit... I, I will mention a bit uh, subtleties of computations in the, in the Outlook session, but, I mean, yeah, the, numer the numerics of this high-dimensional gravity is not that stable, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh. On a related note, like, so, like, uh, I, uh, how long do, so, I get, are you doing this on some cluster, or do you, can you still do it on your laptop, or, like, how long does it take? <laughs> <laughs> we were using it, or uh, we're doing it on cluster. Okay. And uh, on my side, I'm not sure how, how long it, it took Simone, but on my side, I, I do the plot in 5D using using the cluster of Caltech. Uh, it basically spent several days to finish. I mean, the thing is that uh, to get one bound, you can do it in one year in a laptop. But to make a plot like this, like how many bounds does it get? Right? Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. you have to make sure it's you have to make sure it's smooth, right? Uh, yeah, and then you have no degree about that. So this is our result, and I just mentioned Sorry. this. Sorry. Yeah. What, why would you expect that when you take large d to change to a point, or is it just a hope, or is it intuitive? It's my no. Uh, my pure hope. My my hope which is probably not, not, not correct. It's that I, I really hope uh, this, the whole thing can be shrinked to like this side, so then the, like the alpha two, the alpha two is positive, because <laughs> from string theory it's but positive. Is, is it clear that uh, as you increase dimension it should be tighter? Or like, is it, is it intuitive? I, I don't have any idea. It's, uh, yeah, that's true, it has to be monotonic, because high dimensional microwaves can be decomposed into positive So uh, the last part, I just want to mention some implications of this plot. So maybe one immediate implication is that I don't have time. Right? Yeah, to write maybe by words. Oh, okay. We... Okay, maybe okay. Five more minutes. Okay. <laughs> No, it's just, I, I just write down and maybe you can ask me later. Maybe you can ask me later how, how we can see this from the plot, but uh, uh, one point is that uh, from the plot we can see, because we actually includes um, the light matter where the mass is below the gap. So uh, it implies that uh, this M is really some uh, mass for high spin particle. And the second is the species, the species bound that uh, the number of uh, different particles is, is upper bounded by, 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 by this. Sorry, can I ask, but how do you know that when you increase the, I mean, how do you know that when you increase the number of particles you don't know, you don't go into contradiction to this assumption of weak coupling or I mean, um, I guess at this point your assumption breaks down, no? So is it the so, real bound? So this bound is come from yeah. This bound is come from uh, if you cal if you calculate some uh, gravity coupled to matter at one loop and you integrate out the loop effects and it will give you some recent coefficients, 
which depending on the on the number of n. Mm -hmm. uh, so and uh, because the we bound the Wilson coefficients, you know, so it can in turn to give this bound on species. So I, and you're asking if this loop calculation is yeah. If, if you have enough species, then the loops will contribute more, right? So how? Yeah. So I don't know. I'm I'm just uncomfortable because I I have no control over these corrections. Doesn't seem like your procedure has any control over these extra corrections. So I, I have no way to estimate this. So I don't know. I don't understand. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Are you also not changing your definition of m? Because now you're saying it's the mass of a particle. Yeah. Uh, you mean this m? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a sorry, it's a mass of uh, higher spin particles. Yeah, but, but before it was not before. There was something else, it was whatever it had to be, so that loops are sequential. Yeah, so... But, is, but that's a non-trivial leap, right? Yeah, it's an uh, it, implication from the plot because we... How? How do you connect it to... How do you see this? We're assuming that loops are depressed at the scale of the first Sorry, but... But then you're... Sorry, you're assuming that they're suppressed at the scale of the... But then you're putting in the fact that they're... Effective interactions are suppressed by power to them, which is what you were trying to prove. I thought. Yeah, they're suppressed by power to them. It's a weakly coupled. Because we're assuming. Well, we're not. Well, that's even stronger because m. That's much stronger. Something because that m is m is much smaller than. Putting a bound on an arc on the integral over an arc of the integral. Yes. Then you can ask, what is the integral over the arc of the integral? Yes. That depends on on whether the integral is coupled or not. Because if it's coupled, you can compute the integral. If it's not, then you can try harder to compute it or not. Sure, but, but what I'm saying is the structure of the proof is you assume that higher derivative interactions are suppressed by powers of m, and then you prove that they're suppressed by powers of m, but nowhere in there is a connection to the mass of a particle. m is the scale at which the, the particles. No, no, it's the scale at which enough corrections become large, right? That, that's, that's, that's how your proof works. The, the proof is that the integral over a particular arc of the amplitude is bounded by a power over the arc scale. Exactly, but which is the same as saying that the high derivative interactions are suppressed by powers of it, so that loops of those interactions are small. And then you prove that high derivative interactions are suppressed by powers of it, but there's no connection to a mass of a particle. But the integral over the arc is, is equal to the integral over I mean, I guess you're wondering whether it has to be a particle or two particle state. I don't, I don't no, know. No, I'm saying. I mean, the integral of the arc by definition is equal to the integral of the spectrum of the No, I'm saying it, it seems like your proof is circular in the sense that you have to assume that loops are small at energies of greater than m, which means you have to assume that the higher group interactions are suppressed by powers of m. And then the point is you then prove that they're suppressed by powers of m, but you already put that in. No, no, they're suppressed by powers of them quant. I mean, I think that's, that's a, no, no, that's a much stronger assumption. It's much stronger assumption. No, that's that's true. True. You know, I think the cleanest way to think about this, at least for me, is to think about ADSCFT. Okay, the, the assumption we're making is that CT is the biggest parameter. CT is much bigger than delta gap, which is much bigger than one. Okay, that's that's plain, like the the regime of planar angles for supernovae. So then the question is: first, you have to figure out what's suppressed by powers of CT. Then you figure out how things are suppressed by powers of delta gap. We're assuming that CT is the biggest thing in the game. And, and once you do that, you focus on the, that, that strict limit of infinite CT, and you ask about how that theory behaves. It's like asking about how classical string theory behaves. So in that case, it's, it's completely unambiguous how you interpret all of these results. They're, they're results where you know, everything scales, everything is weakly coupled so that you know, everything has some, some CT scaling, and you factor that out and ask about how the ratios of these quantities behave and the limits that CT goes to infinity. And then everything is completely ambiguous. And then you can ask about backing away slices from that limit, and that's what loop corrections are about. So maybe you want to put point two in parentheses, because to, to talk about species bound, to make it more than parentheses bound, we have to kind of go away from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. so this, this is a bit of a weaker thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I just want to emphasize the next point is that from this plot, uh, from this plot we can conclude, uh, if we left it to an SFG, we can give a, we can have a, we can have a sharp bound on, on A minus C over C, that should be something like 23 over the gap squared. Yeah. Is there a way to, like, 
use this technology also when you have a massless particles in the EFT? Uh, yeah, we have massless particles in the EFT. The graviton is massless. No, but I mean other 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 stuff which is not suppressed by quantum. Like, Sorry, like, when like oh, you mean the loops? Yeah, like some loops. Uh, I don't know how to do with loops mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. Any other questions? Lunch, I believe, is in half an hour, right, Miguel? At one. At one, right? Okay, so let's end here as well. Those who are right today, they have the patches here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.